Good morning. Last week uh, I saw two questions on Quora. Actually I was asked to answer these two questions on Quora and I was really almost ready to decline to answer these questions. Mainly because I have no idea and the answer I'm likely to give is unlikely to be upvoted. These questions are one, if a person falls into a black hole could they be effectively time traveling? And two, how far is the singularity in a supermassive black hole from the event horizon where you enter the black hole? I was getting ready to decline to answer these questions when the system asked, and it always asked this, for a reason that I wasn't going to answer. And my, and my answer essentially is that I, I don't believe the usual mathematics they use to model black holes is accurate in the region near or under the event horizon. This usual mathematics they use to model a black hole is called the Schwarzschild metric. The reason I don't believe it is accurate, and I use the word believe, I when I say I don't believe it, I mean I do not feel I have sufficient reason to expect it to be true. The reason I do not believe it is accurate is because it is, to my view, an equation built on an approximation, built on an approximation, built on an approximation. So what I'd like to do is discuss the derivation of the Schwarzschild coordinates as I understand them, like an outline basically of the derivation. And for that maybe I'm not using a terribly good source, but it's the only source that I can guarantee to understand the author's meaning. I'm looking at my own post from uh, two and a half years ago, um, three and a half years ago, on physics forums called Einstein's 1911 prediction gravitational lensing. But my efforts on this were motivated by a much more concise derivation on a website called mathpages.com in an online book called Rel Reflections on Relativity. In a chapter called Doubling the Deflection, reasoning is put forward to derive one part of the Schwarzschild metric. So, so here are the basic steps of Kevin Brown's Reflections on Relativity to de derive one part of the Schwarzschild metric. Number one, we start with an enclosed platform accelerating in the x direction. We will orient the x direction so that it's upwards on the page. And so you can picture like sort of a rocket under this or something like that. It's a, it's just um, moving upward that way. Not necessarily moving upward in that direction, it may just be accelerating in that direction. Here you can see an animation of what I'm talking about. The elevator may be going upward and accelerating upward, or it may be coming downward and accelerating upward. But it will, if it's going down, it slows and comes to a stop, then accelerates back upwards again. Then we have item 2 on the list, which you probably saw in the animation. Light of a given period going from the bottom to the top of the platform, elevator, whatever. Anyway, those were distributed out and we're rising up in the elevator. Um, before I go on to item three, I just want to mention these four confusing ideas about traveling waves. Um, frequency, wave number, period, let's call it the period DT for now because we're going to be using that later to think about the period between the waves, and uh, wavelength and I will write that out. So frequency is F, um, wave number is K, period is DT here, uh, wavelength is lambda. Now frequency is measured in Hertz or inverse seconds. K, uh, wave number, I don't think they have a technical name for it, but it would be measured in inverse meters. 
Um, it is sometimes referred to as just the frequency, but it's a spatial frequency instead of a temporal frequency. Uh, period is measured in seconds, of course, and lambda wavelength is measured in meters, how far apart the waves are. So the big question in this calculation is the comparison of the period at the top, or the period between, right here I have them represented as pulses, so our little uh, point-sized photons. Right here I have each of them represented as little point-sized photons, but I think each of these little point-sized photons, we could count them, think of them as peaks or troughs in a wave. You can see in this animation, though, that the dots are coming out of the bottom of the elevator at the same rate. Uh, the dots at the top of the elevator are hitting the top with greater and greater frequency as the time goes on. Over here on the right, I've got the dots sh shown as they're coming out. Dot, 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 dot dot, 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 dot. But um, as it goes on, you can see that they're hitting the top of the elevator with greater and greater frequency. In a, relativistic, in a relativistically accelerating elevator, you would have two other phenomena taking place. You would have the apparent speed of the clocks changing, and you would have the apparent length of the elevator changing. So here is what that would look like. The um, outside the elevator, you see the elevator being contracted, reaching a longest length when it stops, and then getting shorter again. This animation is imperfect, though. Um, the rate at which the photons uh, come out should change over time, so that they should come out slower when the elevator has a high relative speed, when it was going fast up at the top and the bot coming down fast and going up fast. And they should come out the fastest when the uh, elevator is stopped. So let's look for a second at what the uh, equations on mathpages.com say. Um, this one says x1 equals a over 2 t squared. That is the uh, equation for a parabola um, that just s hits the surface. So, so this is the zero point. This is where the elevator comes to a stop and starts accelerating back up upwards. And then this one is the same parabola drawn up above like that, um, but the distance between them is L. Now if a pulse of light is emitted from the bottom of the elevator at time t1 and absorbed at the top of the elevator at time t2, we have the relation that, let's say this is x2 comma x2 comma t2, and this is x1 comma t1. This is the position and time at which the uh, photon left, this, left the bottom and when it reached the top. And they can calculate this is a over 2 t sub 2 squared minus um, a over 2 t, t sub 1 squared, basically. It's this, x2, l plus a over 2 t2 squared minus this, um, x1, this should be a t1, this should be a t2, I guess. Now, you might notice that if we use that value there, or say that value there, um, when t is far from zero, we're going to get some weird answers for this. <coughs> so we could correct this in one of two ways. Number one, we could fix the equations 
so that the top and the bottom of the elevator follow hyperbolic paths instead of parabolic paths. So we can fix the equation so the top and bottom of the elevator move along hyperbolic paths instead of parabolic paths, and the rates of time changed according to the rules of special relativity, or we could just consider the solution where the acceleration is relatively flat. Okay, by relatively flat acceleration, I mean the acceleration should be small relative to the size of the elevator, um, but that doesn't quite make sense. I mean, this, in the space-time diagram, the speed of light should be nearly vertical. Okay, okay, maybe I can draw on this and make my meaning clear. Right now, this this line is significantly longer than this line. But if the uh, speed of light were much higher in this diagram, then I would just draw the speed of light being that distance there, that distance there, say that distance there, um, would move basically would not take any time at all on this scale on that scale for the photon to move from the bottom to the top of the diagram. And if that were the case, then all of these lines would be the same length. But let's look at the hyperbolic graph for comparison. You have the same phenomenon to some extent. The lines over here are longer than the ones over here. But unlike the um, the parabola graph, where this parabola is identical and lifted from this parabola, um, this version of the graph does account for the special relativistic effects. For instance, the Lorentz contraction of the accelerating elevator, which makes, uh, say, this distance is less than this distance, and it's the same as wherever it is at a similar speed going the opposite direction. So in any case, here is what it says on math pages. Solving equation 1 for t2 at time t1 equals 0, and inserting in that equation into the equation for that same instant. So what does this mean in the context of what I've been talking about? It means that we're going to ignore everything except for maybe this one photon here. If we set t1 equals 0, then we're dealing with the photon that emits from the bottom of the elevator at the point in time exactly where the elevator comes to a stop. Whether we do that with the uh, parabolic or the hyperbolic version of things, these two curves up at the top are pretty similar in that region, whether you do the parabolic approximation or the hyperbolic approximation. Um, this one is similar to this section right here. This section is pretty similar to this section right here. Now, I think there is some unstated assumption here that ought to be stated. Um, now I'm talking circularly because I was trying to state that earlier, that the speed of light should be nearly vertical, or the acceleration is relatively flat. If I draw the par parabolas like, well, something like that, that's a bad diagram, but um, in such a way that by the time that light gets up there, the relativistic effects are already um, noticeable. So what I'm saying is, if the acceleration of the elevator is so high that significant length contraction of the elevator would happen while the photon was underway, then we're not going to be able to use this approximation. So let's plan on revisiting this question later after we get as much of this as done as we can. We'll come back and ask, is this a fundamental problem with the derivation of the Schwarzschild metric at the highest gravitational fields? But for now, I'm going to accept as given that we can, in principle, locally, if you're standing inside, inside the accelerating elevator, you could detect a difference between the emitted frequency of the light from the bottom of the elevator and the received frequency of the light at the top of the elevator. 
Furthermore, that difference in rates should not change over time. It should not matter to us if we are standing inside the accelerating elevator whether we are temporarily stationary with respect to some arbitrary outside observer. And in fact, at any given moment, we are stationary relative to ourselves. So at any given moment, we are stationary relative to ourselves. So we can justify that if we are viewing the elevator from the inside, we are in kind of a weird state of being in a constant temporary state of rest. So that sounds kind of funny. It's, it's hard to find a way to express this idea. I think what I'm essentially trying to get across is what's called the principle of equivalence. So you may be familiar with this idea. If I'm in a rocket ship um, standing um, on, the f on an accelerating rocket ship, or if I'm in a house sitting on the ground, um, there is no way for me to tell without looking out a window whether I am accelerating or if I am just sitting on a planet um, stationary. Let me say that again just in case I flubbed it. There's no way for me to tell without looking out a window whether I am stationary in a gravitational field or if I am in a rocket accelerating upward. But at any given moment that guy in the rocket is stationary with respect to some hypothetical observer. From that hypothetical observer's point of view though, that rocket ship looks like it was just now traveling backwards, comes to a stop, and is now moving forward again. But from the point of the view of the guy in the rocket, he is in a constant state of rest relative to himself, even though he is also in a constant state of acceleration. So I think one reason I may be belaboring this point is that maybe I'm trying to stall doing the math, but I'm also trying to see that if it's justifiable. But let's get back to the math. So let's get back to the math. When T1 was an emission time from the bottom of an elevator, and T2 was the absorption time at the top of the elevator, after the elevator had accelerate, had basically moved according to um, moving at a constant acceleration, A, uh, we could calculate this relationship between T1 and T2. I'm just going to add one little thing here because the derivation, uh, in my opinion, is somewhat nonsensical in its present form. We need to make both T1 and T2 a function of some other variable because T1 here represents the emission time of a single photon. We'll soon be taking dT1 which is down here, d, dt1, which is the differential change in the emission time of a single photon. So I don't think that that expresses the idea very well of what dt is. dt is a period between either successive photons or the period of an electromagnetic wave or something along those lines. We need a set of t1s and a set of t2s so that we're accounting for multiple emission events at the bottom of the elevator and multiple receiving events at the top of the elevator. Only then can we compare dt2 over dt1 only um, because we're comparing the rate at which events happen at the top of the elevator to the rates at which associated events happen at the bottom, bottom of the elevator. Okay, and anyway, this would be equal to the period and the frequency are inverses, so this would be frequency two, frequency one over frequency two is the same as d2, dt2 over dt1. The math is fine, yes. We're essentially just taking a total derivative of this equation. First, we separate things out. T2, take the t2 minus t1 over there and get that and leave the rest of it on top. Take the derivative of both sides. Derivative of t2 is dt2. Derivative of t1 is dt1. Derivative of t2 squared is 2t2 dt2. Divide by that by 2, we just have 1. Same thing there. Divide by 2, we just get 1. 
After that, once that is done, it's just a little bit of algebraic manipulation to solve for this ratio. Um, I just re... I guess that's just the same thing again. Um, and then, I don't know, subtract this term from both sides and then add this term to both sides. Or no, scratch that. We want to get the dt1s on one side and the dt2s on the other side. And when we do that, uh, this is going to be minus, or is going to be minus c dt1 on one side, and then we're going to take the dt1 over here, which will be plus t1 plus t1a times dt1, and then on the other side we would have we'd have this t2a. Um, so T2A, and then from this side, we're going to pull over a minus C. So then divide, and we get DT2 over DT1 equals T1A minus C divided by T2A minus C. And if you want to multiply that by negative 1 over negative 1, you would get C minus A T1 over C minus A T2. And then divide both by C, and you would get 1 minus A over C T1 divided by 1 minus A over C T2. Voila, that's what we have. So what does that mean? That's my trouble with algebraic manipulation and calculus. By the time I finish a problem, I get an answer, and I usually forget how to interpret the her, interpret it into the concepts that I started with. In this case, here is what's going on. If I give you any t1 and t2, this is telling you the period of events at the top of the elevator, dt2 divided by the period of events at the bottom of the elevator, dt1. Now we already know that t2, when it hits this top of the elevator, is just a function of t1. So actually, this could be expressed in terms of t1 only. And also, as per our discussion earlier, we don't so much care about what's going on when the elevator is coming down or going up fast. We want it from the perspective of somebody that's, of a person that's on the elevator, which means we're interested in finding the difference in the rate of time here to the rate of time here. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this equation and we're just going to take this photon, sorry, I'm going to make that a different color, this photon here, the one that is emitted at t1 equals 0. So we'll plug that into this equation and get c equals l plus a over 2 t2 squared minus 0 squared all over t2. And this, if we solve that for t2, we get that point there, t2 equals I'll first just multiply by t2, t2 on both sides, and then and then pull things over and around so it's a two, so this becomes a quadratic, and then you use the quadratic formula x equals negative b plus or minus square root of b. What is it? ac. So that would be al over two minus four times no b squared minus four ac b squared is c squared minus 4 times a l over 2 would be 2 a l. And then all of that is over 2 times a over 2. Or something like that. I'm horrible at this stuff. Now that quadratic form should give you pause because that means that we are actually going to sometimes get two solutions. And actually, I can kind of tell you how that transpires. Um, 
this isn't going to show it very well, but let's say uh, the speed of light was a little bit faster in the diagram, or no, this would be slower. If the acceleration were sufficient, I still drew it crooked, but you could get two solutions out of this, and this actually will give two solutions. There's going to be another point way up there where the uh, curvature of the parabola will come up, and this straight line will pass through the parabola again. Um, so that is where the elevator accelerated past the speed of light and intersected with the, uh, the photon. It is also possible to have parabolic arcs that would intersect that only once, or to have no solution at all if the uh, elevator were accelerating so quickly that even that photon never reached the top of the elevator. But none of that is mentioned here. Uh, in the uh, in here, they just solve solve equations for t2 at time t1 equals zero. They will look at this and pick one answer. It's going to have to be C, that, that second solution where the elevator passes it is going to be this, is going to be the larger solution. So let's pick the smaller solution, C squared minus 2AL over, um, what is that, A, an A? And bearing in mind that I may have screwed that up, uh, in the calculation because I wasn't taking any particular care when I worked it out. Um, plug that in for T2 there and do some algebra and presumably we will get that. But what do we get when we multiply A over C times C minus square root of C squared minus 2AL over A? we would get 1 minus square root of c squared minus 2al over c. And what would we get if we took 1 minus uh, 1 minus that quantity there? We would get positive square root of c squared minus 2al over c. And what would we get when we plugged t1 equals 0 into this and took 1 divided by um, this? 1 divided by that is just going to be equal to c over square root of c squared minus 2al. And then if I took the top and bottom and divide by square root of c squared over square root of c squared, 1 over c, let's do that way, then we would get on the top 1, and on the bottom we would get square root of 1 minus 2al over c squared. So wow, I got it right, or I did that calculation correctly. And this is sometimes what, what gets me about this, is when I read something like that and see that thing in math and then that thing in math, and then there's a lot of people that promote the use of math as a is a tool of things that can't be expressed in language. Are there really people out there who just see those mathematical equations and just see all of this in their head? These things sometimes that I spend weeks or months. Um, this morning I've, you've just seen half an hour, but I've been working on this since seven o'clock this morning. It's been three and a half hours. And here's where I am in the derivation. We've gone, okay, from there, doubling the deflection, I went to here, saw those equations, and there I am. That's how far I've gone. Just uh, less than about a, about one page, one page in here. And the next step is where we get come to what I was calling step three earlier, because I outlined this earlier and said one we consider an enclosed platform accelerating in the x-direction. Consider light of a given period going from the bottom to the top. We compare the period at the bottom to that of the top. Okay, it was actually step four. Use Maclaurin series expansion to give a second order approximation for the comparison of frequencies. And that's where we are right here. Um, going from dt2, dt1 in this form to 
um, frequency instead of uh, periods we do the reciprocal and it is frequencies um, so that it's just flips that basically and then it's approximately equal to 1 minus al over c squared and that is a that is called a Maclaurin series expansion um, a second order one because we're just using maybe even a first order Maclaurin series expansion I'm not sure well we've hit the 30 minute mark that's actually too long and sometimes results in a crash of my computer or a lost video so I will continue on this project at a later time or date